Hi everyone, I'll talk you through uh, our last experiment, okay, and this is not a recycled lab, this is actually a, one we haven't done before, so this is uh, nice and fresh for full 2020, okay, so vapour pressure of liquid, so, um, you know, we'll go through the experiment, before we do that of course, I'll give you the old checklist, okay, so checklist, It's one of those GRP 101 things. I go to the group site. Download the appropriate file. It's the whole birthday thing. So you'll be getting the standard experiment we teach in the regular semester at school, but where the data set provided. So you won't obviously take the data. You're not gonna go to the lab and play with a gas syringe, right? Okay, so I'll talk about the experiment though in my pre-lab, I'll talk about how we'd set it up and do it. Okay, but then you're just gonna kind of pretend you've done the experiment, you've obtained some data, and then you just work it through. Okay, so I'll spend most of my time on the um, calculations, but I will work through and show you how the experiment works too. Okay, so Get to the uh, group site, download the thing, and then if I get the date right, I think it's December 4th is the Friday of next week, something like that. Whatever that Friday is of the last week of work, it's due then. Okay, all right, so let's take a look at it. Now, what I'm going to do, I'll actually talk you through, so I have this kind of out with you, okay, I'm going to have it kind of underneath there. But I'm going to talk you through my original kind of in-person pre-lab, okay? So vapor pressure of liquids, what we're going to do, now you can think about this, okay? <laughs> so if you have a glass of water on your nightstand and you kind of leave it there for a couple of days and then you look at it again, the level's gone down, right? It's not elves drinking the water. <laughs> right, that's a joke, right? Water, as you know, slowly evaporates over time okay now the water that evaporates is of course a vapor or a gas right and because it's a gas it exerts a pressure and that's called vapor pressure so over a closed container all right if I had a just a beaker with maybe ethanol in it right and I put some kind of lid on top the ethanol vapor would go from the liquid to the gas and there'd be some ethanol gas or vapor above its kind of parent liquid, okay? And that's true for every single liquid, okay? Every single liquid is slowly evaporating, okay? If we put the lid on, we stop the evaporation and we get a fixed amount, it's called saturated vapor pressure, okay? So the maximum amount, and that depends on temperature. As you know, in the summer, the hotter it gets, the more humid it gets. Humidity is water vapor in the air, okay? So as temperature goes up, so does water vapor pressure. Now, I think, yeah, here's the, here's the picture. Here is the actual graph of vapor pressure, okay, in tor, right, okay, versus temperature for water. And if you notice, water boils at 100 degrees C, yeah, and then if I come across here, that's 760 tor, and that's the definition of boiling, okay, when the vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure, whatever temperature that is, it's said to be boiling. Okay, so that's the definition of boiling when vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. Okay, that's why things boil at lower temperatures in Denver because they're up a mountain, there's less atmosphere on top, lower pressure, lower boiling point. If you were to dig down to the earth far enough, you'd have more air on top, higher boiling point, which is kind of interesting. Okay, and as you can see, that's an exponential. So we don't have a linear relationship, we just look up vapor pressures at certain temperatures. If you look back to the gases packet, when we collected over water, that was the same number, okay? So the same number for vapor pressure at a certain temperature was what we used in that uh, gases packet. So you might wanna go look at that before you do this lab, okay? Now then, so back to the original pre-lab, okay? So we're gonna investigate the relationship between vapor pressure, just talked about that, Think of humidity and temperature, okay? So it's an exp exponential relationship. And if I was to show you the results of a previous class's work, you can generate a graph that looks like that, okay? So obviously that's kind of a, 
in here somewhere. It's kind of shallower because we're looking over a more limited temperature range, but that's the temperature at the bottom versus vapor pressure. And we can record both of those things in the lab. So in the lab, we'll get to it in a second. You record temperature and vapor pressure, plot a graph. That's the graph, all right. So ultimately, we're gonna generate a graph through the investigation of vapor pressure versus temperature, fair enough. Okay, now, <clears throat> interesting. So alcohol boils at a lower temperature than water. Oh, if it's boiling, it's making a gas, right? So things with lower boiling points generally have higher vapor pressures. And, you know, one thing we did in our lab was we take methanol, which is light, and ethanol, which is heavy, okay? The more higher the molecular weight, the higher the boiling point, the lower the vapor pressure. And we'd see for ethanol, we'd expect to see a lower vapor pressure. So for just for one of the temperatures, room temperature, we'd compare the light molecule with the heavy. The heavy molecule would have a lower vapor pressure, right? Because it's higher boiling point. Okay, if you like, it takes more energy to get it up into the gas phase, okay? All right, so set up, and this is how we would actually set this thing up. And it's a nicer picture in the, uh, in the, in the lab there. Okay, so, you know, there's the, there's the lab picture. Okay, so just to talk you through it. We have a really large, like, you know, one, I think it's actually a five liter, or um, uh, five liter beaker. And then inside we have an Ermai flask, okay? And that's where the a little drop of, uh, put it in there, a little drop of methanol or whatever it is goes in there. And we shut the whole thing. We shoot the, <laughs> the methanol in through the syringe there, okay? And then, you know, we can measure the pressure and the temperature of the system, okay? So it's just a way of getting temperature and pressure data. Now, the great thing about it, and if you look at my picture here, it's kind of a simplified version. So the temperature of the gas will be the temperature of the bath. Now we do room temperature first, so there's no water in the bath, right? So room temperature, whatever it is, 22 degrees C, whatever, okay? Measure, square it in the methanol, it evaporates, so the pressure in there goes up. And we record the pressure at whatever temperature the probe says, okay? And then because we've got a water bath, we can just simply add mixtures of hot water, cold water, ice and cold water, and we look at between zero to five degrees C, 10 to 15, 20 to 25, put a little asterisk next to that, that's the one that's room temperature, just the air bath, if that makes sense, and then 30 to 35. So we mix hot and cold water, different temperatures, different pressures, okay? So we get our data set. So a data set's actually pretty straightforward. You know, and if I look back here at your experiment, this is probably gonna be filled in for you, right? So one, two, three, four for methanol, right? Remember, we're gonna generate that graph for methanol. And then just for comparison, just one point, not on the graph because it's a different material, one point for ethanol just to kind of show you the difference between light and heavy molecules, okay? So trial one, now trial one's interesting, right? There's down here no correction, right? Because we're doing it at room temperature, right? Okay, so that's very, very important, right? So we're gonna compare everything to the room temperature experiment, right? Okay, so trial one, whatever the temperature is, 22 degrees C, whatever it is, in Kelvin, and then the measured pressure. Okay, we'll talk about the math down here in a, in a moment, okay? But you do that for every single trial. So either you raise the temperature, lower the temperature, right, the temperature and the pressure in kilopascals, it doesn't matter what unit you use because remember zero pressure is zero pressure whatever scale, okay? All right, now, fair enough. So, you know, we talk about collecting the data there, all right? So we get our data and then the fun part. Okay, then the fun part. Now, when I teach this in the actual lab itself, okay, I give students, you know, an hour and a half or so, eight or nine, 20, an hour and 20 minutes to collect the data. And then we gather back at the board and we talk about corrections. Okay, now here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. We will. You know, it's probably been done for you. I'm not sure if it's been done. I didn't actually check the data tables, but uh, you know, you'll get your degree C and definitely your pressures, right? Maybe you convert to Kelvin. So you need Kelvin temperatures and pressures. And we're looking at that relationship, okay? Now here's the thing, the air pressure, because if you think about it, and this is the key point, when you have that flask, right? 
there's already air in there, yeah. Okay, so as soon as you shut this thing off, the pressure inside and the pressure outside at room temperature will be the same because you just trapped air from the room in the flask, right? Then you squirt in the methanol, some of it evaporates and you get an extra bit of pressure on top. So the pressure in the flask is actually the air plus the methanol, right? I'll put P for pressure, right? So we're gonna see an increase from a number that's already established, right? So we're not starting at zero with the pressure, we're starting at the air pressure that's already there, okay? So say it was 760 millimeters of mercury and it went up to 780, okay? We'd have added 20, right? And that's the way we do it. Okay, so if we look here, when we've got no correction, what does that mean? Well, it's just a room temperature, right? So it's the air pressure is what it is, and you know, it's up here. So, you know, before we do the experiment, I should have mentioned this, before we do the experiment, it's maybe 103 or something. That's 101.3 is actually 760, right? So 760 millimeters is 101.3 kPa, and we'd write it there, right? So therefore, the air pressure would be the same right here, because we're just like living at that condition. And then the vapor pressure would be, hey, the measured, maybe it's 105 minus 101 before, right? So we subtract the air pressure from the measured pressure. Remember the measured is the air and the stuff, right? Subtract the background air and we get the vapor pressure. That's why when you look at your graph here, the vapor pressure is not in the 100 range, because 101.3 kPa is one atmosphere, right? It's in the zero to 25. That's the difference between atmosphere and mixture, right? Okay, so fair enough. So that one is the one, you know, as long as you get that one right, remember the basics here, you get your measured pressure, you have the atmospheric pressure, you subtract to get the actual vapor pressure. Okay, fair enough. Okay, now when you start changing the temperature, pressure is proportional to temperature in a fixed container, right? So if I have ice water, the air pressure will lower in the container. If I have boiling water, the air pressure will go up in the container. So it's like this sloping baseline. We're not gonna subtract the same number every time, right? So that's why it says corrected. So we have to do a correction, okay. Pressure is proportional to temperature, right? Okay, so that air pressure will change proportionally with temperature in Kelvin. And that's what, we got. that's what we've got here, okay? So problem, okay, calculate the vapor pressure so that's that last column which you'll plot, right? By subtracting the air pressure, right? But that air pressure will change based on temperature. And the first one, it's just room temperature, it's okay. Here's our problem. So pressure is proportional to temperature. Must figure out the new baseline, right? Okay, so P over T equals P over T for each trial, right? So if I call this trial one, all right, and then that's N. So the pressure in the first trial divided by the temperature in the first trial equals the pressure in the second trial over the temperature in the second trial. And this is for air, remember, right? So that's that whole correction thing here. Yeah, so we're gonna do a correction. The new air pressure, which is that guy, for each trial. Let's work it out, right? So let's work it out. Pn equals P1 over T1 times T2, so it's like that whole direct proportionality, right? Okay, so we can find the new corrected air pressure based on temperature, stick it in there. So if the temperature doubled, the pressure would double. That's an easy concept, right? But these numbers will be like, you know, something like, so say it goes up by 10 Kelvin, it'll be like 283 over 273 or something times the pressure, right, of the room temperature. Okay, and there we go. Oh, I did it down there for you. <laughs> okay, so I did a little bit of math kind of on the fly there. But you know, actually on the board I would have written that. So there's your equation. The pressure corrected, the atmospheric, atmospheric pressure corrected for each trial, okay, which is here, is the atmospheric pressure of trial one times the ratio of the new temperature over the room temperature. So if the temperature goes down, the atmospheric pressure will be less. If the pressure goes up compared to room, sorry, if the temperature goes up, it'll be more, okay? So add that corrected baseline in that air pressure line in the table.
All right. Then, life's easy. We simply subtract air pressure from measured and we get some small value. You plot that information, just rearrange it in Excel if you use Excel. So, you know, the lowest pressure and the lowest temperature go first and then you just run it up from there. Do not plot a straight line, fit a curve, right? Because it's non-linear, okay? All right. So, plot a graph and then just answer the questions, okay? Now, good news. I'm all about extra credit on this one. I'm not gonna require you to do the Klaus Clapeyron extension. I will do it for 10 points lab credit, right? Okay, turns out that as we saw here, this is a non-linear relationship. Humans love straight line relationships, linear relationships, right? And that's what we're gonna do. So basically, and turn this into a straight line. And to do that, you don't plot the pressure, you plot the natural log of pressure versus the reciprocal of temperature, okay? And when you do that, you get a lovely straight line, okay? Now, when we looked at the thermodynamics packet, we looked at the heat of vaporization, right? The energy it costs to turn a liquid into a gas for one mole, okay? Turns out the slope of that line, which is linear when plotted in that form, is delta H of vaporization, okay? So Klaus Clapeyron is all about finding heats of vaporization in a graphical method, okay? So you can plot Y equals MX plus B, and then, you know, you've done this multiple times, solve for M, okay? Honestly, I'm not quite sure how they set that up with your data sheets. Feel free to cut and paste Excel graphs if that's the way you do it, or if they perhaps provide you with a graph, just cut and paste that one. There's a snip tool, if you use a PC like me, there's a um, the search for the old snip tool, and you can just, you know, real, real simple, copy paste into a Word document, okay? All right, so this is gonna be due by literally the last Friday of the regular semester. Uh, this is the second to last video of the semester. The last video is actually um, a review packet, which uh, we're taking the ACS final this year, which we've not done online before. So I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a head start on that with a review packet. So I'll post that as soon as I can. Today is Monday the 23rd, okay? Thanksgiving week. All right, cool. So I'll post that as soon as I can. And if you look at the uh, GRP site, where it, where it talks about the exam, it talks about the ACS study guide, and I mentioned that all the way back in our first ever meeting. So if you want to go back and look at the syllabus, I super, super recommend you get the ACS study guide, okay? Because it's not just for 101, it's for 102 as well. And then guess where the MCAT, the PCAT, any kind of cat, Thundercat joke, right? Any kind of like graduate school entry exam chemistry questions come off the ACS general chemistry course, okay? So that's really good for later, okay? All right, so I did mention that, I think, seems like a long time ago now, 15 weeks ago. <laughs> okay, time flies. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Again, if you've got any questions about this lab, you know, ask in the discussion or the water cooler chat. And of course, uh, office hours, Thursdays, nine o'clock. All right, stop there. See you guys next time.